This video gives you a short overview of the neurobiology of disorders that are characterized by aberrant emotional functioning. The aim is to demonstrate how knowledge about the normal functioning can be used when you approach these clinically very prevalent disorders. After an introduction on a more general level, we will say a few words about the specific disorder in this group, the major depressive disorder. So remember the previous module on emotion. In that video, we described the multitude of emotional functions and what makes up an emotion from a neuroscientific perspective. How it starts, often as a reaction to something, and how it's then expressed and regulated. So if any of these functions are disturbed, it can present as a psychiatric symptom. So here, let's see a list of a few examples. For example, disturbances of effect regulation can lead to constant worrying or bursts of aggression. For some psychiatric disorders, these symptoms are the most characteristic. So let's look at the same table again and the third column. Worrying is a core feature of generalized anxiety disorder and episodes of aggression is characteristic for intermittent explosive disorder. As we mentioned earlier, the current diagnostic manuals group disorders according to the symptomatology and course, and not the neurobiology. When correlating symptoms of disturbed affective functioning with findings from neurobiological research, it's usually found that, on the one hand, often the same biological systems that are involved in mediating normal emotional functioning are also involved in the disorders. On the other hand, most disorders are symptomatically so different from person to person that it's hard to draw any firm conclusions on the exact neurobiology. So if looked at from a neural network perspective, these disorders tend to involve the limbic and paralimbic brain regions and also their associated networks, which basically overlaps with the so-called emotional brain. A few of these regions seem to be critical for specific some symptoms, for example, amygdala and insular cortex associated with fear and anxiety, hippocampus often affected in stress-related disturbances, anterior cingulate cortex when there are symptoms associated with depressed or elevated mood, inferior frontal gyrus seems to be critical for aggression. A similar pattern can be seen for the regulatory neurotransmitters. The same ones as are mediating the basic emotion systems also seem to, involved, seem to be involved in the pathophysiology of the emotion disorders, not least the monamines, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, melatonin. For each disorder there are specific neurobiological models trying to explain the factors behind their composition of symptoms and their cause of disease. We will now exemplify by a major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is a very common psychiatric disorder. Globally, around 300 million people suffer from depression. It is also the leading cause of disability worldwide. The essential feature of a major depressive episode is a period of at least two weeks during which there is either depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure in nearly all activities. Associated with these core symptoms are sleep problems, appetite problems like significant weight gain or weight loss, psychomotor agitation or retardation, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, diminished ability to think or concentrate, and also thoughts of death and suicide. So despite this precise list, there can be many important clinical differences between the patients. Everyone has their own story. And most likely, this reflects that there are several ways to become depressed. So let's mention some of the more well-researched theories. The monoamine theory. This states that it is an underfunctioning monoamine signaling over the synapse in critical brain regions that lies behind depression. Support comes from pharmacological treatment studies. Many medicines effective in treating depression also increase this neurotransmission. 
In regards to the stress-related theory, another common observation is that some kind of psychotrauma often precedes depression. Being abused as a child, losing a near or a dear one, prolonged periods of work-related stress. All this seems to, be af to affect the neurogenesis in hippocampus, which is a very stress-sensitive part of the brain that is also involved in mood regulation. During depression, there are also higher baseline levels of stress hormones. Yet another theory is that depression is an inflammatory brain disease. Repeated observations show that there is increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body during depression, and that causes the typical changes in the brain. So when you think of it, several of the depression symptoms could also be regarded as a form of sickness behavior, such as social withdrawal tendencies, reduced hunger, and having no drive. On top, antidepressant medicines have been shown to be anti-inflammatory as well. An additional theory, just to show how many ways in which depression can develop, deals with the white matter changes. If depression surfaces amongst the el elderly, then it's often combined with white matter abnormalities in the frontal regions. What they consist of is not known, but they look like vascular changes. Possibly they interfere with the functions of the frontostriatal networks. Some research also suggests a final common pathway on the level of failing neural networks for depression, independently of the underlying pathophysiology for depression to occur. <clears throat> Two regions frontally need to be malfunctioning, the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex and the lateral prefrontal cortex. This can be seen on functional brain imaging, and it discerns well individuals who have developed depression from those who haven't. And it also predicts which individuals will benefit from treatment. These are some examples of the many theories behind how depression can develop. Again, these models should rather be seen as complementing and overlapping. Most disease models for depression can easily fit in the diathesis stress model framework. For example, for a genetically sensitive individual, certain environmental factors are really difficult to handle and could start a period of high stress, which increase the stress hormone levels that can affect nodes in critical neural networks, causing a network failure which in turn leads to altered behavior and makes typical symptoms to occur. All this reflects well how a diagnostic system, including many observational levels, could be beneficial. We hope that this video demonstrates that studying the neural underpinnings of normal behavior and the basic principles of psychopathology is a good preparation for also understanding the nature of specific disorders, such as depression. So just as in other medical specialties, we need to be prepared for a rapid progression of knowledge. But with this as a foundation, we hope that you will be well prepared to also incorporate new findings and directions of the field.